Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Welcome to the Town of Colony Library Speaker Series. Tonight I have the privilege to introduce a speaker who has served as the Chief Medical Examiner for New York City for many years, who currently is the Chief Forensic Pathologist for the New York State Police. He has served as expert witness in the trials of O.J. Simpson and Phil Spector. He's also helped the Russian government identify the Romanov family's remains. I have had the privilege to work with Dr. Michael Bodden in the State Commission of Corrections, where he assists us in death investigations. Please welcome Dr. Michael Bodden. Now, I started out in New York City, Bellevue Hospital, Medical Examiner's Office, uh, and I was there for about 25 years in the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, held many jobs, including that of Chief Medical Examiner there, and around 85, 86, came up to Albany, was asked to be uh, the chief forensic pathologist for the state police, and found a home there. Down in New York, it was interesting, uh, we were always competing with the, for funds uh, with the health department. And the health department wanted funds to, to uh, you know, stop um, rats from biting children, which I think is important. And we needed funds to get people who can do autopsies. Uh, and we always lost because there was something like 4,000 medical doctors in the health department, and there were like 10 doctors in the medical examiner's office. So we were not very much appreciated. But coming up to the state police here in Albany, I'm the only forensic pathologist in the state police, so they have nobody else to listen to. So it, <laughs> it, it, it works out uh, pretty well. But when they ask about uh, how do the programs like CSI uh, compare to reality, I think in general, in general, um, the, the, the issue about how well is forensic science um, described on, on our television uh, pro forensic science programs, I think most people, all of you, when you look at the, the television and the, it's an hour program and with 10 to 15 minutes of commercials that um, you know that there's certain television license. People know that one person doesn't go to the scene, do the autopsy, interrogate witnesses, uh, capture the bad guys. One guy doesn't do all that stuff and you know that. What you don't know, the thing I think that's uh, a concern is that um, on television, 100% of the time, they get the right, they solve the case, and the murderer is caught. In real life, counterintuitively, when I started in the New York City Medical Examiner's Office in the 1960s, the solve rate for murder was um, 80, 85% in New York, and and around the country. Uh, nowadays, that was in the 60s, before DNA, before uh, toxicology improvements, before um, uh, ability to compare um, evidences. Uh, today, the solve rate last year in New York City was like 48%. There's been a big drop in solving of murders despite all of the uh, advances we've made. A part of that, part of that is, um, has to do with, uh, with uh, the fact that in the past, some of the cases that were solved were innocent people. And the DNA has shown that innocent people can be wrongly convicted. Uh, that's a small number, I think. The, um, the big number is people don't realize that we do get a benefit from advanced medicine. Uh, in in uh, 1960s, 
I would do autopsies on people who died of stab wounds, in particular, head injuries in a fight, um, who don't die anymore because CAT scans, better medicine, so the number of homicides has gone down. But the stab wounds and the baseball bat injuries were largely friends and relatives. Our, our mantra was the biggest risk factor in murder is uh, marriage because uh, <laughs> so that, so that, uh, but those are the ones that often can be treated rapidly. The stranger murders by gunshot, the drug abuse murders, they don't get solved. They, they, um, uh, they still die. And there's no DNA. Fifth, less than 15% of murders is DNA an important factor in the whole scheme of murders. So it's largely that um, we don't have, um, uh, we don't solve the more difficult cases. Number two, this is a lesson also in, um, with uh, Iraq and, and the veterans hospitals where in the World War II, something like two out of 10 people who had head injuries on the battlefield, yeah, that's right. Now we'll go back to number one. That's uh, Medgar Evers, we'll get to him. Is, is Herman Thomas here? No. Uh, Herman Thomas is a coroner, is now a coroner up here in Albany. That, you see, the one on the top, number one, would have been, you, you showed it on that uh, slide sorter. There it is, okay. And then how do I, do we have a, a person? We have a person and I'll say, Janet, next please. Okay, but you needed something to sit on. No, no. I'm sorry. Do you need a drink or something? <laughs> okay, just, just to get started, I, I think what happened with, uh, and things we can learn, what happened with uh, Iraq, and I do work with the veterans' hospitals. I get involved when there are serial murders in veterans' hospitals, which is another th issue. Uh, we had, we, and we had uh, an issue here in Albany uh, Veterans' Hospital with research that was improperly done on veterans. Uh, that's, that's a different lecture. But in, uh, it, when coming back from Iraq, in World War II, about two out of 10 people who got head injuries in the battlefield returned to the, to, to the States. In Vietnam, because of MASH and because of better treatment uh, in the field, something like four, four out of 10 uh, were able to get back uh, to hospitals uh, away from the uh, battlefield. And that's what they were prepared for when we went into Iraq, that there'd be four out of 10 coming back, and instead now it's about eight out of 10. Eight out of 10 people injured on the battlefield with head injuries come back, and that's because of the tremendous increases in, in uh, healthcare, and the CAT scans, and early diagnosis and treatment, so that the, the um, uh, veterans hospital beds were just filled up, and they, they led to, the, uh, to a bit of uh, problems, uh, political problems uh, with uh, uh, how come we can't treat our veterans now because we weren't prepared for it and what, didn't think ahead. Given that preamble, uh, and I mentioned that, uh, I'll, I'll go through some material here, but uh, what I want to mention is that we have to have humility, is that still there'll be, f let's see, 7,000 deaths today in the United States. 50 of them will be murders. Most of those will not be solved despite all of our uh, uh, advances. Um, now, I work for the state police. Next, please. Now, the, can we lower a light a little bit, uh, Janet? How do we lower this one? <laughs> I blame Janet for everything, because <laughs> she, yeah. Now, in our, in our Western culture, this is our first murder. Adam killing, e uh, Adam, not Adam, Cain killing Abel. Thank you. <laughs> there, there are, what, there are four stages of senility? 
first stage, you forget names like Cain and Abel. <laughs> Second stage, you forget uh, um, faces. Third stage, you forget to zip up your fly. Fourth stage, you forget to zip down your fly. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like three and a half, so you'll have to <laughs> bear with me. Well, I, I'd like to show this to, to police, because I, I work, I do a lot of lecturing with uh, police organizations and all, and they tend to be very much um, pro-gun uh, and pro-death uh, penalty, naturally. Uh, here, in the first murder, uh, God knew that Cain did it, um, and Cain confessed. Cain said that he didn't say I didn't do it. And yet, uh, God did not extract the death penalty on, uh, on, on Cain. He sent Cain out to the, to the uh, land of Nod, to the nomads, which confused me as a kid. I mean, what the hell's going on here? Here's Adam and Eve all by themselves, and there's a whole land of nomads? But that's, a, that's, a, that's another issue. That, that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> So they send him out to number, and in Genesis, I mean, this is all, I'm paraphrasing Genesis. <laughs> and, uh, and Cain says to God, he says, but when they learn that I'm going, that I killed my brother, they'll hurt me. So uh, God puts a mark on him to protect him, the mark of Cain. Doesn't say in Genesis where the mark is, but the mark so that everybody would know that he's under God's protection, even though he did kill his brother. Uh, so that's how we start out. And what happens here is, now as then, most murders are still solved by confessions. Uh, people saw what's going on, people admit what's going on. Uh, forensic evidence, like even um, DNA evidence, uh, which is super in any kind of sexual attack or, or uh, sexual murder, but less than 1% of murders are sexual murders. Um, so that the, the, much of the tools that we've developed don't specifically apply to murder, despite what's on, on uh, television. The, 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 the cases on television all have some kind of uh, forensic aspect to it, but most murders don't. Next, please. Now, as we go along, and I must say, probably can't see it. I'll, I'll, I'll read a thing. It's just one or two slides with writing on it. Um, this started, this started my, this lecture that I'm going to give to explain it, is a few years ago, my wife and I were in England, in London, and we went to a play that was all of, the na title of it, all of Shakespeare in two hours. I went in there, and sure enough, they, well, you know, uh, with all of Shakespeare's plays, they fall into groups, and they go through the groups, and then two hours, it was all done. I said, if they could do all of Shakespeare in two hours, could we do all of murder in two hours? And in fact, it's easier, because between, as you will see, between, um, Cain and Abel, and the 20th century, very little happened with murders. We'll go through the high points. It's only in the past uh, 50 years or so that there's really been advances made in the murder investigation. Getting tired? I'm sorry. You're, you're good. You're not a physicist, are you? Don't get elected. Don't get electrocuted. I'm okay, OK, thank you very much. Now, so what I'm trying to do is to show what happened in, uh, in, um, uh, from the time we came and able to, to approximately now. After Cain and Abel, there's still most, uh, uh, most homicides are solved by confessions. Some of them, you know, you had to dunk the person in the water a few times before they confessed. <laughs> but they're, or, or, you know, if you lit a fire under them and they didn't burn, they were, they were innocent or something. Now, 
Oh, shucks. No, no, no. I, I, I turned it off. I swear I turned it off. Uh, I, here, can you hold that? Turn it off if you can. Well, don't open it till, because then you'll have a person on there. Um, uh, along comes Julius Caesar in 44 BC. When Ju and you'll see the connection. Thank you very much. You turned it off. You sure? You got to take the battery out or something. Uh, in 44 BC, according to Suetonius, I'm going through some of this because I assume some of these books are in the library here. They still haven't. They still haven't all gone on to Kindle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when Julius Suetonius has a brief paragraph in his history that when Julius Caesar is going into the forum, uh, he's set upon by other senators and suffered 23 stab wounds, only one of which was fatal. That's according to Suetonius, and that's uh, despite the fact, thank you, despite the fact uh, that there was no autopsy. But um, when, when Shakespeare gets a hold of it, he makes Brutus the one who does the stabbing and makes it more interesting, uh, as on television, but not necessarily accurate. Uh, there was one of the senators was a, uh, a physician. Uh, his, his name was Antistius. And Antistius goes over to the dead body, describes the wounds, goes into the forum, and then announces in the forum that Caesar had died of 23 stab wounds. That's really the origin of the word forensic. Forensic comes from the same pe as the root for the forum. It really refers to public speaking. In the old, time, in the old uh, Ivy League schools, some of those schools, uh, they still have departments of forensics, which is departments of public speaking. Now it's kind of thought to be legal because most of the public speaking goes on in courtrooms. But uh, so, so we come into the term forensic where the physician or some other person gives um, his or his, they were all his in those things, uh, information to the public, somebody with spe expertise. Next, please. Then, uh, Oh, this is uh, from Suetonius, though. Hmm. Next, please. Uh, now, now we come to England. Um, all of you probably have good feelings about uh, Richard the Lionhearted. This is Richard the Lionhearted um, because he had a good public relations guy who wrote Ivanhoe and said that, so Walter, Walter, Walter Scott, I get Walter Scott and Walter Rawley mixed up. So Walter Scott writes this thing about Ivanhoe and he says that Richard Lionheart was a friend of uh, Robin Hood, therefore he's a good guy. Richard Lionheart was probably the worst king that England ever had. Uh, he came from German stock, never learned how to speak English, uh, was always out fighting wars, and was on English soil maybe six months in his entire reign. And he's captured in, the, in one of the early uh, uh, crusades by the Austrians during the crusade in um, 1192, around 1192, and his brother John, later to be famous for giving us the Magna Carta, for signing on to it anyway, under duress, but. Um, and uh, so, so uh, he's, he's out there in the Crusades, gets captured, and the Austrians want ransom. So in order to get the ransom uh, collected, John, his brother, appoints three noble knights in each shire to collect money and taxes, and uh, especially for anybody who committed suicide. Because in 1066, when England gets uprooted a bit, the king realized 
that he remains king so long as he have, has enough troops. So there's a merger between theological thought that only God can, uh, who gives a life can take a life, therefore suicide is bad, with secular thought from the king saying that um, he stayed king as long as he had enough troops and if somebody kills himself, therefore uh, he loses a troop and he, can't, he doesn't have as big an army. So how do you punish somebody who commits suicide? In 1066, or t uh, 1066 when the, this when it, same way they do it now. If you take out a life insurance policy and you commit suicide in the first two years or so, it's, it's invalid. In those days, if you committed suicide, then all your properties were forfeit to the crown and your heirs didn't inherit anything. And that's how they got money. Because as I understand, they didn't have air conditioning in those days and life was tougher in those days than, than, than now. So uh, he, and, and the people who were, who were uh, appointed to, to go investigate deaths, each death to see if any of them are suicide, uh, were called crowners, appointed by the crown. It's 1192, 1194, and later corrupted to coroner. To coroner. So these are appointed, and initially these were noble knights who were appointed. But uh, very quickly, over the centuries, it degenerated uh, so that for a certain amount of money, we wouldn't call it suicide. For more money, we wouldn't call it uh, uh, homicide. Uh, and when we inherited the investigation of death um, system that we have in this country in the 1600s, 400 years ago, we inherited the coroner system. And I will say to you, without meaning to offend anybody, because Albany is still a coroner state, whereas, however, uh, is that uh, the coroner system is, is the one institution that has survived 400 years with very little change. Anybody uh, in most states, including New York State, can be a coroner who's voting age and who's uh, a citizen. And they've got some super coroners. The coroners can be excellent. They can uh, be concerned, and they're often much more concerned about and able to talk to family members than, than uh, physicians who are in a rush. But it wasn't until 1880s that a medical examiner system began developing in, in, in Massachusetts and Virginia and later New York City where physicians had to be, where the person's thought to be most knowledgeable about how people died. And that, those are called medical examiner systems and there are two kinds of medical examiner systems. One with which any doctor is in charge and one which the forensic pathologist is in charge because the forensic pathologist is the one who really is trained in unnatural death. 92% uh, of deaths are natural, heart disease, cancer, stroke. And in those situations, any physician is uh, trained and competent in, in cancer, heart disease, and very good in issuing death certificates. But accident, suicide, and homicide, which 8% of people die, it really takes training beyond the, um, the uh, medical school and, and uh, internships and residency, and that's the area of forensic pathology. There's um, 800,000 physicians in, in the United States, something like 20,000 pathologists who work in hospitals mostly, and less than 400 who are trained in forensic pathology. And that's one of the reasons why the solve rates in murders have gone down is because in the old days, whatever the district attorney said would have been, uh, was accepted, whatever the medical exam said was accepted, and uh, after Watergate and all, they, they developed you know, some kind of suspicion that maybe the government isn't always correct. And, uh, and defense lawyers are much more active now than they used to be in the old days. And they've got a, the prosecution has to prove its case. And a lot of um, errors are made often at autopsies and collecting forensic evidence and things like that. But in this, back in 1192, King Richard is, is how the concept of the coroner developed. Next, please. And here, 
this goes around 1840 uh, or 1850. And I would say to you, this is a woodcut. Thomas Wakeley was the coroner. He was a physician in London. And most coroners were not physicians. He was a, a physician in London, and he was a brilliant physician. And he really developed the coroner system to be a medical system rather than just a, um, uh, a uh, whoever happened to get elected uh, if they didn't have any competence at all. Next to him, on his left, is Charles Dickens. See that fellow up there with, on the, now, which is very interesting to me because Charles Dickens starts out doing, clever, doing government work. He was a clerk in, in, in the government and all in London. He worked for Wakeley. Up until Dickens, almost all novels about people, plays, Shakespeare, were about the upper class people, kings and royalty and uh, rich people. It was really Dickens who started talking about poor people and about kids who were orphans and kids who didn't have parents. And, and I think he learns that as we do every day in the medical examiner's office, much of what we see in a, in a medical examiner's or coroner's office are people who don't have proper medical care, people who are drug addicts, alcoholics, uh, people whose, uh, whose parents beat them or rape them, and then they take that out on their children. We get battered generations of uh, battered children and things, so that uh, uh, we still have a law, an overrepresentation of poor people in current and medical examiner's office to this day. One of the things that Wakeley did, he started the Lancet. The Lancet is one of the two premier medical journals in the world. The other one being the New England Journal of Medicine up here in Boston. And uh, the Lancet is still going. He started as a physician. The first 20 issues of the Lancet had a number of articles by Dickens describing poverty and describing poor conditions. And uh, um, I think any medical examiner, myself included, when I started out uh, working the medical examiners in New York City as a uh, uh, intern and resident, a doctor at Bellevue, and I'd go out and see the terrible situations where children died, where alcoholics died, where, where uh, there were no medical care, no uh, rats would be running around while you're looking at the body. Uh, you have to go out, as Dickens did, to see that in order to be able to write about it. Next, please. Now, the murder of the century, of the 19th century, to show you how uh, fleeting is fame, uh, took place at Harvard. This is also about in the 1840s. Uh, next, please. I'm sorry, what is your name, please? Eldor. Eldor? Elga. Elga, thank you very much. You do this very well. Uh, thank you, I'm glad you got a seat. Uh, Dr. Webster. Dr. Webster was chairman of the biology department at Harvard Medical School. Next. He owed money to Dr. Parkman who was, interestingly, he was a English professor in the university, in the college. And he, he had a wealthy fan, came from a wealthy family who had given a lot of money to Harvard. This is the 1840s now. He had gone over to England and was very impressed with the new ways that were developing in treating mentally ill people, in separating the mad people from the bad people. Prisons in the United States had the bad guys, the, 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 the people who uh, were murderers and robbers mixed in with people who were mentally messed up, who were schizophrenic, who were uh, manic depressive, were all together in the United States. And he started uh, a sanitarium in Boston to try and separate out the mentally uh, impaired from the people who were deliberately uh, doing bad things. But he also had real estate, shows you. Real estate 
despite the lesson I took from uh, uh, Clark Abel and Gone with the Wind, what was it? <laughs> land, get land or something, you know, the land is the future. It ain't always the future, apparently. <laughs> but anyway, he goes out and Webster next, well, here, you see here, Massachusetts General Hospital on your left, this is in the 1840s, Harvard Medical School on the right. Here, they used to autopsy the bodies in the medical school and then dump them in the Charles River. They don't do that anymore, they say. <laughs> but, uh, but what happened is Webster was the chairman of the biology department at Harvard, at the medical school. Parkman comes in one day and, uh, to get, get his money that, that Webster owes him and uh, is never seen again. So uh, there's a big investigation where, because he was a prominent figure, a wealthy family, and they couldn't find him. Next, please. The janitor at, at the medical school, while all this investigation was going on, noticed that the furnaces were going more, uh, uh, more prominently than usual. They were on for quite a while. So he goes down to the furnace, and he finds fragments of jawbone. And this is the first case, first case in uh, the United States in which um, an expert witness was used uh, in a murder trial. And the expert witness in this case was Parkman's dentist who reviewed this prosthesis that was made, dental prosthesis, and identified it as the one that he had made for Parkman. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, um, Paul Revere had identified a, a general, a, a, uh, an American general during the Revolutionary War from the gold teeth that he had made. Uh, but this is the first time it was done in court. It was done in a, in a legal proceeding, and this would be a first forensic expert. People who, had, who testified were the, Oliver Wendell Holmes testified in this case because he was the dean of Harvard, and he testified for the prosecution uh, in, in this uh, Parkman-Webster case. And uh, because of the uh, identification by the dentist, next please, uh, he was convicted. Webster was convicted, and uh, uh, that was, and he ha was hanged uh, it was before the electric chair because they didn't have electricity. Uh, he was hanged uh, well, like in eight months or nine months from trial to conviction to whatever appeals they had uh, to, to hanging was about uh, eight or ten months. Now, while that was going on in the United States, the most famous uh, um, murders in in England on the continent were Jack the Ripper. This is the outside of the building of the last of the f five victims of Jack the Ripper in the summer of 1888 was, uh, was, the, uh, uh, was when these five murders occurred. Nowadays you get five murders, nobody comments about it, but then it was a big deal to have five murders. And they were all, they were all prostitutes but they weren't sexually assaulted. So it wasn't sexual uh, uh, serial murder as is often the case nowadays. This was just uh, um, for reasons not all clear, uh, uh, five prostitutes that were killed. This is the uh, last one. Uh, next please. And inside uh, is, the, this is, a copy of the original photographs. Photographs were now being taken in, in uh, murder cases. Photo photo photography was developing in the 1850s, 1860s, all the Civil War photographs that we have. Uh, and they were also being taken. And I still think to this day that with all the advances in forensic science, the most valuable is still photography and scene photography in, in particular uh, because it allows you to go back and see what may have been there that was not initially thought to be important, but with new evidence, new investigation, all of a sudden become important. 
here, and this is 1888, we have, her name is Marie Kelly, Marie Kelly. Uh, uh, there's a lot of blood on the nose. There are fingerprints, actually, on the bloody fingerprints on the wall. But we didn't, fingerprinting hadn't developed yet. Uh, blood groups hadn't developed. Lonsteiner gets the Nobel Prize for finding ABO groups somewhere about 1910. Uh, so that uh, uh, they never were able to figure out lots of conjecture who the murderer was. But one of the things that happened is because of the um, embarrassment of Queen Victoria in, in uh, not solving this murder, these murders, uh, they strengthened Scotland Yard and made, uh, strengthened the detective division in Scotland Yard because up until that time, most uh, calls for the police were handled by cops on the beat. You know, whether it's a murder, whether it's a burglary, whether it's a cat in a, a tree, the same police would go on. And there was a, uh, a uh, um, uh, narrowing of detectives who just do murder investigations and of doctors who just do murder investigations. So the, f the first forensic pathologist, uh, Sir Bernard Spillsbury, was assigned to Scotland Yard about 1904, dedicated just to murders. And his first case, a famous case, he was able to identify uh, a body uh, buried in the cellar uh, from a scar on the abdomen, even though the body had been dismembered the abdomen was still there and they had a certain kind of surgical scar that permitted identification. And he became very uh, well known in, in England and uh, committed suicide around 1940 by sticking his head in a stove. You know, we used to have carbon monoxide. When in the 1930s, the 1940s, God bless you, I think, uh, the, uh, the most common means of suicide in a city like New York was carbon monoxide poisoning because we had raw carbon monoxide coming in to the, keep the refrigerator going, a little flame there, and to uh, keep the stove going, that you turned on the stove and you lit it, and the carbon monoxide and hydrogen, CO and H2. And the idea behind it was that it would burn, oxidize to H2O, water, and CO2, and just go into the atmosphere. And it was great when it worked, but if the the gas jets were on, left on without a flame, then you die. So it's amazing that people like me, who had to get up three or four or five times a night to make sure that the, the gas jets were off, um, you know, weren't more uh, impaired than, than we are by that, that uh, experience. It wasn't until about 1954, 55, that natural gas came into the big cities. So if you can leave natural gas on all the time, and you can't die from natural gas, it's mostly methane, except if you do what was recommended after 9-11 or something, if you wrap your house in, in plastic with duct tape and keep all the oxygen out, then, then you can die, because you have to use up the oxygen and not be replaced. But uh, as long as uh, um, uh, you're not in a sealed environment, then, then uh, uh, you don't die from uh, um, the gas jets being left on. Uh, next, please. So we're now up to about 1910, see, without too much changing going on. They had a very high uh, solving of homicides in those days uh, by various means. Um, Locard was a professor in, in uh, the Sorbonne in, in Paris. And he developed a concept that's the basis for all crime labs uh, in this country, uh, around the world, in which he stated that whenever there's a bad guy coming in and does harm and uh, hurts somebody or steals something, they leave something at the scene. Uh, the suspect leaves something at the scene, and that's Lockhart's principle. And the scene leaves something on the pro, the suspect leaves something on the scene, and the scene or the dead person leaves something on the, on the uh, perpetrator, such as, next please, 
here, this is a good example of Lockhart's principle. Uh, this is a fellow um, who was uh, questioned by the police after a woman in uh, midtown Manhattan, Manhattan in a high-rise building is heard yelling and screaming by her girlfriend across the hall. Girlfriend puts on her robe, goes out and sees the door wide open, her, girl, her girlfriend dead on the floor, a lot of blood around, a knife sticking out of her chest. She immediately calls the police. Police respond immediately. First thing they ask her, is she married? The husband, you know, the spouse is always under suspicion. The, the girlfriend says, no, she, she's been divorced for about a year, divorced for about a year, and um, uh, the police then say, do you know where the ex-husband is? Because ex-spouses are also under an umbrella. He says, yeah, lives down in Greenwich Village. So they immediately zoom off to Greenwich Village and they get to his house uh, before he gets there. So they're waiting on the doorstep in the brownstone uh, when he comes walking in, and the first thing he say, hey, how'd you get that, those marks on your neck? Usual answer is, uh, cut myself shaving. Uh, they take his clothes, I'm not sure they had a court order or not, but those days it didn't, wasn't that important, uh, and they send it to the lab. Next uh, slide, please. At the lab, now this is me, when my fingers are much thinner than they are now. Uh, and that's the wife, the, the, the decedent with a broken nail. In the cuff, in the cuff of his pants, was this broken fingernail, see? And which matched up geographically with the broken nail on the finger, and also by ultraviolet light. There's, if you put ultraviolet light on your fingers, you'll see a lot of little lines of different colors that's a different in each finger and all. Uh, so uh, under, under the pinky there on, on, on the le your left uh, was some of the skin from his neck. Lokart's principle, she leaves something of hers, the fingernail in his clothing, he leaves some of his skin in her finger. Uh, the low cards exchange. And that's what happens when you're looking for hairs and fibers and uh, saliva and semen. Uh, the semen uh, match the, the, the donor or so. Next, please. Now, here, uh, in going through some of the interesting cases, in 1918, we're up to 1918 now, uh, the Romanov family disappeared. And this was Tsar Nicholas, Alexandra, and uh, uh, Anastasia is, is, is over to your right, and little uh, Alexei is, is a little boy there who had hemophilia. And uh, they disappeared when the, the Reds came in, Lenin came in, and uh, it was always a mystery because the Russians didn't want to say that they had killed the, the Romanov family which had ruled the Romanov family at that time, 1915, 1916, was the longest living dynasty in Europe, in the world, since, for 300 years since, um, since the 1600s. Uh, the Romanov family had, had ruled Russia. And what happened here was, uh, um, when, the, uh, when the Bolsheviks took over, they were killed, and their bodies were found, well, bodies were found in 1990, uh, 94, in, Serb in, in, uh, in uh, the, the um, in, in the Russian uh, uh, tundra, and um, th there was a dispute as to uh, which, uh, whether they were the Romanov family or not. That was a dispute that somehow the New York State Police got involved. They wanted some outside experts to come and to determine this was in the Ural Mountains in Sir Siberia where their bodies were. Uh, and uh, we had a group that, that went over from the State Police uh, Forensic Division 
and determined that they were really the Romanovs from the DNA that was done, uh, now available in the 1990s that wasn't available in 1918 where they'd been buried. Next, please. But uh, in 1920, this Sacco and Vanzetti, um, they, Sacco and Vanzetti were Boston anarchists in those days, and there was a shooting, and um, somebody was killed during um, a melee, and they were both uh, convicted, uh, caught and convicted of the shooting, and it was the first time in court that evidence was introduced about matching a bullet markings uh, in the courtroom, which was testified to that the two guns involved, the bullets involved came from their two guns, and that was the basis for their being uh, executed. It turned out Henry Lee was asked to review all that evidence, because that evidence is still present in Boston, and it turned out in one of the cases they were right and one of the cases they were wrong, that there, it really wasn't a match, but that's, uh, but th that really introduced um, bullet markings and matching bullets to weapons into the courtroom. Next, please. In uh, 1924, uh, Clarence Darrow introduces psychiatry into the courtroom. They were called alienists in those days. With the Leopold and Loeb, uh, the Leopold and Loeb uh, trial, where Leopold and Loeb thought they were very smart, bright um, geniuses. They were all way ahead in their, uh, in, in number one in their classes in, in the various universities and all, and uh, decided that uh, they could kill somebody and get away with it. So they got a little, a little uh, young man who was part of their circle uh, and killed him and left them in the park and they were going to get away with it, except that Leopold dropped his eyeglasses at the scene in a culvert, the culvert in the park where they put the body, his eyeglasses fell out of his pocket. And that's how they finally caught him. And they confessed to it. And the issue, the only issue at trial was whether they were going to get executed or not. So Darrow, and you can still do this, you could probably Google it if you don't want to read a book. Uh, about his, uh, his uh, uh, speech to the judge, uh, it was a judge trial, uh, as to, uh, uh, to spare their life and it gives the, the uh, very strong case against capital punishment in 1924. And he succeeded, they got capital punishment, they got life imprisonment, not capital punishment. Leopold dies in prison in the 30s in a homosexual melee in, in, the, in the prison. Loeb was in for about 50 years, and I think in the 70s was released from jail. Uh, they both came from very rich families. Loeb goes to Puerto Rico and sets up a little health clinic there that he works on for about 15 years before he dies and does some good works and contributions there. Uh, next, please. Now, um, the, the uh, scene investigation uh, became very, and, and the autopsy investigation uh, became very prominent in the Lindbergh trial. That's in the, in the th 1932, where uh, the Lindbergh baby disappears in New Jersey. And uh, there's a worldwide, he was, he was a hero, Lindbergh, at that, at that time that we don't have anymore today. He was idolized all over the world for his ability to fly across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in an airplane by himself, nonstop. And he was idolized all over the world, he was a hero, and his child disappears. His child was 20 months old. And next please. And uh, uh, he, he um, the baby was found a few months later uh, by a truck driver who was going off sound, uh, to, uh, to uh, urinate. Uh, and he sees the body there, uh, the skeletonized remains. And uh, it was only a half a mile away from the Lindbergh uh, house where, they, where, they, uh, where it was kidnapped from. 
uh, and um, the, the body was identified. Cause of death was not properly established. I had to review this at one point for a, a 50 year anniversary thing that was done to review all the forensic sciences in the 1932 and 1982, how things had changed. And one of the things that changed is that the autopsy at that time was done by a funeral director who was 82 years old, who was the coroner, who had big stubby hands and couldn't, and he thought that the baby had just choked on something. Uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't clear what the cause of death is. But uh, uh, the person put in charge of the investigation in New Jersey was a fellow named Schwarzkopf, the father of the current Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf had been a general in World War I for America. And after World War I was over, New Jersey in 1930 or 31 established a state police uh, division. And he was made the, in charge of it. And for whatever reasons, with him and it started largely with him, heads of state police are called colonels. They're not called generals, you know, around the country. The, like in New York State, the, the, the uh, head of the state police is a colonel. So that, um, uh, and, and apparently the FBI, the, the, the investigation of the Lindbergh death involved New Jersey where the body was found, um, Brooklyn, New York, where uh, a doctor came forth to uh, help in the investigation and to he communicated with, acted as a go-between between, between uh, the, the murder of Houtman, it turned out, and, and uh, Lindbergh, and the FBI, because it, it involved two different states, and the, the, the um, FBI, uh, when you read the old notes of it, they thought he didn't know what he was doing, that he was a hindrance, Schwarzkopf, but he had a son. And his biggest claim to fame in my book in those of you who may vaguely remember radio, was he was the voice in Gangbusters. In the beginning of Gangbusters, Gangbusters was a serial half an hour thing that we listened to every Sunday night or something, and it said something like, uh, um, you know, bad guys are always gonna get caught by the police, in better terms, but he had a very deep and nice voice, and he was the voice. And then when World War II comes along, they make him a general again. He's a general in Iran, and he becomes friendly with the Shah. And that's where his son, Schwarzkopf, grows up. And reason he knows a lot about the Middle East because of his, uh, where he uh, grew up. Now, uh, next please. I want to show you how how much you learn. If you just study forensic science, you learn about all these things. It's like, it's like stamp collecting and um, uh, collecting autographs. Whenever you do something like that, you learn about all the things around it, you know, that, that you may not think initially were related. So we come to, uh, so I'm, that, that's some of the forensic science and how they get introduced. O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson really, the, the issue, uh, uh, came to uh, uh, the crime scene and the uh, cause of death. Uh, this is the scene that's uh, uh, Nicole Simpson up around uh, 11.30 or so, lying down, and already there have been dogs and people that have been wandering in and out. The scene wasn't properly preserved. Next, please. Uh, uh, this is uh, Smear. Next, please. And here, you see, on her back, <clears throat> there are various blood spatters. And one can tell a lot by the laws of physics about where they come from. The slower the, the blood is going down, the bigger the splatter will be. The faster the blood is coming, like in a gunshot wound, when the blood comes out, it's very fine mist because of all the energy that's imparted. But if it's a, dro a drop of water or blood that's dripping from a spoon, say, It'll keep a uh, shape, it'll be pretty big. And that's how you get some of these large uh, 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 spatters. Those spatters would have come from the perpetrator. They couldn't have come from her. 
because she's bleeding from the neck. They couldn't come from cast-offs from um, the other decedent, Goldman, who's off in a corner, because they would have a different shape. They'd have a, 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 an angled shape. Uh, and what happened at the scene, they photographed them, but they didn't collect them. And the, we know from, from CSI and all that a lot of evidence is lost at the crime scene if one doesn't protect the crime scene and uh, wear proper booties and things like that. <clears throat> what isn't realized, the second most common way in which evidence is lost at a scene, at a loss in a case, is in the transportation of the body from the scene of death to the uh, morgue. For example, here, what was done was she was photographed, then put on her back into a body bag, blood coming out and thing. And by the time she gets down to the morgue, all of the blood stains are washed off. They're, and they were all impaired so that if they had taken some of these smears, and we try to train our officers, that when you, in a homicide case, when you move a body, the body should be moved in the exact same position it is. If it's face down, you move the body face down. And at the morgue, we have better lighting usually, better equipment is when you take the specimens. Or if some specimen is going to be lost in transport, um, to swab it and take it at the, at the scene before, before the body is moved. But if we had to had a few of these uh, larger blood drops collected, uh, that would if it was OJ's blood, that's, and in that case, it's somebody else's blood, then that person has to have a pretty good explanation. Next, please. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.